Georgetown uh, University's uh, Global Economic Challenges Network, and we have Frank Francis Vella, professor at Georgetown, who is uh, uh, in charge of this network. I would also like to thank uh, Stan Spos, uh, Chair on Digital uh, Governance and uh, Sovereignty, and Florence Pistel, who organized the conference tomorrow, and I would uh, recommend highly to attend this conference tomorrow. Uh, today, we'll talk about uh, the problems that uh, uh, the new technologies, in particular uh, social media, create uh, for societies, economies, and um, uh, political processes, and whether Web 3.0 can offer solutions or create additional problems. And we have a very distinguished uh, uh, panel with us. Uh, with uh, from from my left, uh, we have uh, Brian Rich uh, from Accenture, where he has the global AI uh, practice for the public sector. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have. Um, Anupam Chander, who is a professor at Georgetown Law School, uh, and we have Nate uh, Persili, uh, also a law professor at Stanford Law School, and on the screen on Zoom we have Francis Hogan, who is an uh, advocate for transparency and accountability of social media. You, of course, know Francis from her work uh, on, uh, on uh, Facebook files, on this one, uh, on uh, Facebook's uh, uh, questionable practices of content users' data and algorithms. Um, I won't take uh, much time. I, uh, I'm Sergey Gurif. I also work on those issues, but mostly on Web 2.0 and not 3.0. So I'm only here to ask questions rather than to provide answers. But I am, as a as an economist, as a political economist, I'm very worried about where we are. Uh, basically, for people around uh, who are mostly young people, you probably don't remember when Facebook was different. Uh, more than 10 years ago, Facebook didn't have a like button, uh, didn't have an algorithm. I actually remember a time when Facebook didn't exist even. Uh, but um, overall, what has happened in recent 10 years is something that uh, uh, a very important uh, sociologist, uh, Zeynab Tukfekci, called us how social networks took us from Tahrir Square to Trump, where initially we thought that uh, the internet, social media, are a liberation technology. And there are quite a few political scientists who wrote papers and books calling new social media, new internet technology, a tool for mobilizing protest, for holding power accountable, for increasing transparency. And uh, then we discovered that social media is also a place where this business model, which maximizes attention and engagement, and therefore invests in making the services addictive create also an environment where false news are disseminated quickly. So basically, the idea, as, uh, as another important scholar, social psychologist, uh, Jonathan Hyde uh, called it, we have a dark psychology of social media, where basically social media want to maximize attention. And for that, they need to identify items which outrage you more, because this is what maximizes engagement. And so since truth is mostly boring, and false news are mostly exciting. You create create a natural system where uh, false information dissemi is disseminated more easily. Uh, so I'm worried, uh, and I think uh, by this time I hope that you are scared and worried too. And uh, the good news is we are here with the uh, McCourt Institute, and the idea of McCourt Institute is not only to worry and scare us, but also to help us find solutions. And we at Science Paul, as well as our partners in Georgetown and Stanford. Uh, have in our DNA, indeed, to design solutions for uh, our societies. So with that, I'm, I'm uh, moving to our speakers. Each of them will make uh, introductory remarks of uh, five or so minutes. And uh, we'll start with Brian. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you to you, Sergey, and Georgetown and the McCord Institute. It's great to be here. Um, so I work in the public sector and AI space for Accenture globally. And a lot of what we do um, you know, deals with helping governments and institutions deal with disinformation, misinformation. And I think it's not often considered how much money is spent by governments and um, public sectors institutions to help manage and understand um, the source and nature and scope of disinformation that is being um, primarily amplified through social media. And you know, we've been through three kind of very interesting waves of disinformation in the last five years, um, starting with uh, 
the elections uh, and election interference in the U.S. And I think we're still experiencing kind of the consequence of that initial attack um, on the information system in the U.S. Um, and then pandemic and the disinformation about the pandemic and COVID-19. And then the, the wave of disinformation around uh, the vaccination and the anti-vax movement, which was primarily amplified through social media and disinformation, then spills over into uh, traditional media. And then most recently, Ukraine. We're seeing a very interesting um, kind of emergence of deep fake information that's being amplified and kind of this market of conspiracy theory that emerges. Um, and so when we think of Web 3.0 from a public sector standpoint, um, I think the nexus with, with law and uh, technology law is really around the authentication, the governance, and the resilience of information within a society, you know, when you think about it from a, a macro perspective. But then there's also our dependence on technology companies, which, you know, have done amazing things to transform society in positive ways. But over time, as we move from analog to digital societies, um, you know, Web3 really presents kind of a unique opportunity to um, disintermediate technology companies and potentially shift governance paradigms back towards citizens um, and society in ways that I think are important to the transformation of how this kind of Web3, the role Web3 plays um, in emerging society. With that, I'll pass it to Anna. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sergey. It's a delight to be here. Um, so the question I want to try to answer is um, just, or propose to all of you is, how do we do big things? Um, so Web 1.0 was one effort to do this. Uh, this was to connect the world. Uh, the ambition was incredible. Uh, it wasn't. It came out of essentially France, if you if you actually want to think about it, because uh, Tim Berners Lee was working in a particle physics laboratory, it, literally in France, outside Geneva, uh, at CERN. Uh, and so Tim Berners Lee, of course, is a French uh, is is not a French, but an Englishman. Uh, but uh, his idea of Web 1.0 was to allow individuals to share information, so everyone would. Um, kind of homebrew their own computer as a server and connect it to net, network to the whole world. Uh, and a brilliant uh, um, concept, and he offered it for free. So it was totally not proprietary. Uh, so this was one of the keys to its success, uh, because alternatives, including one for the University of Minnesota, basically said, hey, we may, you know, right now it's free, but we may charge a licensing fee in the future. Uh, so this wasn't the only way to connect uh, information. Everyone was working on this interconnection problem at the time. Uh, so th that's what Web 1.0, where everyone kind of puts up their own blog online. They create their own websites. Um, even then, of course, there is uh, huge centralization. So there was never a moment of entirely decentralized uh, 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 internet because very quickly you saw America Online and other uh, companies that offered uh, much easier pathways to, uh, to be on the internet. Uh, and America Online was originally a walled garden, uh, so essentially uh, the folks at AOL uh, determined what you saw on the, on the internet. The internet was uh, as defined by, uh, by uh, AOL for in the United States, it obviously, um, all this, you know, I should also you say, there's the Minitel, which is also occurring, you know, which predates, uh, you know, uh, much of the, the story I'm going to tell here. Uh, but uh, uh, so the folks here in France will be well aware of the Minitel story as an alternative history. Um, and there, that kind of government, um, how do we do big things? We do it from the governmental side. The government tells us, and there's a, one company working with the government that tells us what the, what, uh, the global computer network looks like. Um, that obviously um, couldn't meet the challenge of the internet of Web 1.0, which offered a much greater diversity of, and riches of information than uh, Minitel did. Uh, so, so, so that's Web 1.0, and then you move to Web 2.0, which is uh, kind of uh, the rise of these uh, platforms that help consolidate 
uh, power, but also it really make things much easier for us. So just think about the, the uh, years in which these companies are founded. Amazon 1984, Google 1998, Facebook 2004, uh, Twitter 2006, uh, Spotify, the, European, the one European company that you might possibly place in this, also 2006. Uh, uh, so GAFAM is really a kind of, except for Microsoft, which is 1975, a product of uh, the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and so then, now, the, the concern, of course, is of, uh, the great centralization that this offered. Now, why did Web 2.0 beat Web 1.0? Well, it was because it was so much easier to turn to Facebook to share your information. It was so much easier to uh, turn to Twitter to share information than to share your information on uh, by your homebrew server. Uh, so it, the ease of access to the world that uh, these uh, platforms offered uh, was uh, was difficult to rival uh, by uh, by uh, Web 1.0 uh, systems. This brings us, of course, to the question of Web 3.0, um, and so the possibility. And here, what exactly Web 3.0 is is still yet to be defined. Um, and so you've got a vision coming out of um, kind of the, the Ethereum world of. Uh, an Ethereum-based blockchain that's going to allow for uh, individuals to uh, to create uh, create uh, digital assets. Oh, oh, sorry, no worries. Uh, to create digital assets that are uh, they don't rely upon a single uh, system to determine who has uh, to whom that asset belongs. Uh, so these distributed ledger systems. Um, and the alternate version, which is a kind of Tim Berners-Lee distributed web, uh, which is based on another protocol. So the question here is whether protocols can replace the centralized entities um, in, in uh, the internet. Um, this is something that's being tested with Mastodon as an alternative to, uh, to Twitter. Um, and we've seen some of the advantages and disadvantages of that. Uh, framework. Um, I actually couldn't log into my Mastodon instance um, from the hotel, and you know, I spoke, I had lots of conversations with the person who runs my Mastodon instance um, uh, about it, and he he concludes that it's probably the hotel that's blocking it somehow, and that there are workarounds for that. Uh, so uh, so anyway, this is all uh, very complicated, and so we'll see. Uh, exactly how um, this evolves. But the critical thing is for the young people in the room is that all this has changed very fast. It's changed essentially during your lifetimes and it may change radically during your lives yet. Uh, and you have the opportunity to shape its future. Thank you. Uh, Nate. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to pick up a little bit where Anupam left off, which is to say that uh, I'm going to talk not just about changes over the long term. I'm going to talk about changes just in the last year, and for the most part, in the last three months. Um, because as, as a, when, when folks uh, like Sergey talk about uh, the dark side of the internet, I, and I tell my students, look, I can't tell you that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but I can tell you there's going to be a lot more tunnels. <laughs> and, and that's sort of where we are. And, and so I'm going to talk about the industry, what's happening in the industry from my standpoint in Silicon Valley, uh, what's happening in the technology, and then what's happening in the policy spheres. And so this is the, think of this as just teeing up uh, a set of issues for discussion. Um, so first, uh, the most significant, sort of at least attention-grabbing headline of what's happening in the industry is, of course, what's happening at Twitter, where we're watching someone learn the last 15 years of content moderation in the space of thir you know, three months or so. Uh, and so how Elon Musk, how the, the industry responds to the way that he is thinking about uh, content moderation or learning about content mm -hmm. moderation and sort of doing it by fiat is, I think, going to be quite important for the way the platforms are going to be behaving behaving in the next, uh, sort of in the next year or two. Um, 
And, and I think the jury is out as to what is going to happen at Twitter. I think that uh, if you talk to you know some of the business people in Silicon Valley, many of whom have been rooting for him, uh, that you know they think, look, what he's done for SpaceX and Tesla, he could uh, maybe turn uh, Twitter around. Uh, if you talk to the advertisers out there, uh, they, of course, have real concerns about uh, the direction that Twitter is going. We will learn, I think, in short order in the next six months uh, which direction this is going. As my colleague Alex Stamos in the Cyber Policy Center, which I run at Stanford, has, has pointed out, the other thing that I think is very interesting and that we have, need to be concerned about with respect to Twitter is not just this kind of um, uh, content moderation by diktat idea, but also how someone who has so many interests in authoritarian regimes, for particularly Tesla's interest and, and dependence, on China will then have an effect on the way that uh, content moderation is done and that the, the platform is run. Second, uh, and somewhat related, looking at Apple, where Apple has now become the de facto regulator of the internet. Uh, because of the effect that the App Store has on the, the way that the large platforms perform, uh, Elon Musk realized this uh, and has now been uh, sort of using his Twitter feed to go after Apple and the 30% share that they're taking out of business uh, done to their platform. Really, I think, quite important. Um, and Apple has been, in many ways, the biggest force in change of uh, policies at Facebook because of uh, concerns about privacy and, and new uh, rules that the App Store has with privacy. Interestingly, it's just in the last few days that Apple, I'd say in response to some of Musk's uh, uh, rantings, has said that, he, uh, that, that they are going to begin um, doing advertising again on Twitter. And so part of the, this kind of dialectical relationship between those two uh, firms, I think, is, is something that's important uh, to watch. Um, third, on Facebook, I think Facebook is on the ropes in many ways. And so while I think when the, the model that people have in thinking about the problems online right now is really dependent on Facebook, but Facebook has lost two thirds of its value uh, in the last year and a half. And so what's happening, if you talk to people inside Facebook, uh, I think there, there's real concern that Zuckerberg is betting on the metaverse uh, and there's real uncertainty as to whether the metaverse is gonna pay off, certainly in the short term, but maybe uh, even in the long term. Last, I just want to say that the beneficiary of a lot of this chaos in Silicon Valley has been TikTok. And TikTok is so understudied, in part because it's, uh, there's so little transparency, um, but it poses a whole host of questions, uh, particularly as it relates to kids and uh, who are the primary users of it, uh, at least in the United States, um, as well as, as how uh, a Chinese firm is then going to operate uh, outside of China. Second set of points, I want to talk about the technology. We'll talk a little bit about Web3. So first, I was mentioning the metaverse, and I think part of the big question here is, is Facebook building something that it's actually not going to be able to take advantage of uh, in w when, it's business, when it would be relevant to its business? I can tell you there are people inside the firm who certainly are worried. We have not dissected enough sufficiently in general enough consensus on what caused the centralized platforms to have problems um, for us to really understand will Web3 address those concerns. So, for example, even in the opening statement where there was discussion around how uh, platforms like Facebook intentionally didn't fix their algorithms because uh, it, being enraged keeps you there longer. You know, being enraged doesn't keep you there longer. Like they've done experiments where they, you know, remove integrity features so that you see a more toxic, more angry, um, more violent potentially home feed and you use it less. The problem was that what they did find was that when you optimize for engagement, when you optimize and said, hey, content which uh, people click on, they give more likes, they give more comments. When we consider that content to be better, the network as a whole thrives because content creators 
enough of them only create for that positive reinforcement that we need people to feed the engine of engagement to encourage the creators to keep creating. And it's fascinating because, you know, there's a white paper from 2018 that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, I'm guessing someone else wrote this, but it has his name on it. There's a 5,000 word white paper that's still up on the internet saying, hey, we know engagement-based ranking is dangerous because people are inadvertently drawn to extreme content. You know, it's the back of our brains scanning for threats. Um, and that, you know, no matter where we set the line for problematic content, pe people will engage right up to that line. Um, and so there's this, this, this question, which is, you know, let's unpack that one level deeper. So a core part of that problem is AI, when we have systems where computers direct our intention instead of other humans, that those systems will always have biases. And the question is, are enough and enough diverse eyes looking at the outcomes of those algorithms for us to spot what those biases are? A huge part of why I support PADA, and you know, Nate, every time I see you, I get excited because you know, a little bit closer to transparency. Um, the only way we can get enough people watching these algorithms for us to be able to spot critical imbalances, for us to be able to put pressure on these companies, either through boycotts, through investor um, investment, through you know, people outside offices, is if we can see what's going on. And one of the things that concerns me a lot about the rise of Web3 is I think almost certainly most Web3 social networks are going to be end-to-end -end encrypted. But like one of the selling points is this network is safe, it's owned by the community, it's moderated by the community, your communications are, are yours. Um, and one of the challenges there is it becomes a thing of like, how do we then spot check those algorithms? Because even the companies that are running or, or the, the organizations, you know, they don't have to be companies, they can be networks of people who are running these systems. In an end-to-end -end encrypted world, we won't get to inspect the biases of the algorithms. And so it becomes this question of, you know, what can we learn now from the centralized platforms while we can still see the content about design principles and figuring out kind of like what is the physics of these spaces so that when we move towards decentralized platforms, we can understand like what are no-go features. So in the case of Mastodon, you know, you were saying before, like things that are good are also not going to go viral as, as fast. You know, I, I think there's questions there around in a world where there can't be, you know, human checks on where the, the machine is directing our attention, attention um, you know, maybe that's just the thing we have to accept, that we have to design spaces that are, are intrinsically safer, even if we have to give up some of that sticky virality. Um, and one thing that we have to talk about is how do we force companies to do that or force organizations to, to comply that way? Because remember, people like algorithms. People like TikTok because it's so hyper-optimized, it's so hyper-personalized. Uh, and, and so it's one of these things where uh, we got here because the market produced these, these products. You know, these are, these are natural equilibrium states of unobserved systems optimizing for market forces. Um, if we assume we can just have decentralization and that those problems will be solved, I don't, I don't think that's true. And then the last thing in closing, um, I do totally agree with the comments made earlier about Elon Musk in China. You know, Elon will not say anything negative about China. And I think the fact that now we have two of the three major social media companies, or uh, let's say there's five major social media companies in the United States, like Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Reddit, YouTube, you know, the idea that two of those, TikTok and, Red, and Twitter, now are in a position where if there were to be a conflict between China and Taiwan, would anything pro-Taiwanese be distributed? Would there become issues involving, you know, um, in, uh, like an information war front in the United States? Uh, you know, there's these questions where we're really starting to have national security issues in terms of having um, foreign actors having so much influence over our social media environment. And that's something I don't think there's been enough conversation on. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, you mentioned something which really scares me, which is the symbiosis of AI companies and Chinese government. There are a few papers in uh, economics now that look at the business of private sector working in AI and procurement from Chinese government, local police departments. Mm, totally. Uh, and basically, when you think about the history of 20th century, Soviet Union lost technological race. 
Because normally, if you are a non-democratic society, it's much harder to provide incentives for decentralized competition, innovation, and so on. But AI is a different technology. AI also demands innovation, creativity, but AI also demands huge data sets. And exactly because of the regulation NATO was talking about, in democratic countries we protect privacy. In China, government collects a lot of data and gives it to AI companies to train their algorithm for face recognition. Now, the symbiosis mm -hmm. is that private sector companies are excited about this because they train their algorithms to use it for private uh, applications, so they do pro for profit business. And so this thing may reinforce each other to the extent that uh, regimes like Chinese ones, well, it's now just one regime, uh, may get ahead of uh, may get ahead in this technological race and actually win the race against their Western uh, Western uh, competitors. So this is something that uh, should really scare scare us. And uh, whenever I ask people uh, why we shouldn't be scared of this, they usually say it's an empirical question. Maybe creativity still matters in AI, and I agree with that. But there is a powerful force in there which totally. Um, uh, totally, it's totally consistent with what you just said. Uh, one thing you mentioned was economic incentives, and this is where I would go back to Brian now, because why do companies uh, want to be transparent? Why would uh, people like me want to spend their time on checking their algorithms? And uh, uh, as an economist, I can mention uh, to you that uh, uh, we have examples like auditing accounts. Brian works in a company called Accenture, uh, people around the table were born after uh, Accenture was renamed from Anderson Consulting. Now, Anderson Consulting was part of Arthur Anderson, which itself disappeared. It was one of the biggest uh, auditing firms that disappeared after Enron scandal, which was uh, when you people around the uh, people in the, uh, in the in the audience were born, uh, because the, the the auditors didn't do their job well. But overall, in current system, you have this institution where companies open their account to professional gatekeepers. And in principle, both have incentives. Auditors have incentives to do their business and maintain their reputation. And companies have incentives to become transparent towards those professional institutions because they want to list in the stock market and because government requires uh, their accounts to be audited. So there are solutions out there. And maybe these solutions are also applicable to the web 2.0, 3.0. Brian, what do you think? Uh, do we have business models that can defend us? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think there's a, there's a transatlantic agreement in terms of, you know, kind of the importance of transparency and accountability in AI. Um, but there's also this very real, strong reality that to be, to have AI have a significantly favorable impact on an institution, you need to <laughs> You need to collect data. You need to access the data in order to, um, you know, build accurate models. So the challenge for the public sector, especially for federal agencies, whether it's in the U.S. or Europe, is you know this transparency around the data and the data models is very important. And there's an emerging, um, I mean, there's a market actually around the auditability of data and data models, and it, it extends to the fact that um, in many um, context, you cannot build models from information that's been scraped from the web because people are not aware that that information is being used by governments um, to build models, even if it's for things like um, climate risk assessment or uh, um, flood risk or things that you would normally consider favorable, food security. And so I think there's going to be an emerging requirement and I think regulation around this because otherwise the digital divide is going to emerge where we are so dependent on corporations for these models, whether they're transparent and accountable or not, that from a society perspective, we really have to consider how do we regulate the access and transparency to data. The accountability from an Accenture standpoint is if we build an AI solution, it has to have a business impact, right? The, there has to be precision and accuracy. It has to work as advertised. Um, the data that we use has to be vetted and transparently available. The models that we build have to be available so that they can be vetted. With, with commercial uh, corporations, it's more of a black box. And you can see numerous indications of major 
corporations who brag about the fact that they have massive amounts of data that they've been scraping from the web. And in some cases, that has a very benign impact. They could be doing the same thing, food security or energy security or supply chain. These are all things that are very important um, applications. But where I think Web3 starts to become strategic in the public sector is around, um, A, the preservation of data. Because there's many situations where the first and only information to emerge on criminal activity in, let's say, Ukraine, human rights abuses, human rights abuse, or crimes against humanity, um, that information, a lot of the evidence is gathered and stored on social media. So who's responsible for, A, authenticating it, two, preserving it, and three, putting it in a state that it can be exploited later on as part of a workflow around criminal prosecution. And so I think governments are in a very unique situation because they have a responsibility, I think, to figure out how to use AI favorably uh, for citizen experience and services. And I think Web3 provides this kind of strategic next dimension to that, where if they do it, if it's if it's done well, and if there's regulatory frameworks, it will, it will decrease the dependency on private sector to play the role of managing and preserving and authenticating government for citizens. So again, I don't think there's big answers, but there's still big questions. Um, uh, it look, for instance, did you want to jump in? It looked like you had your hand up, but, but I don't. Oh, OK. Um, you're muted. But, um, um. But I, one thing I would say is that, that auditing is, uh, like, I, I am, in the last maybe six months, I have become, like, incredibly attuned to the liabilities we as a society have introduced by not auditing the metrics that tech companies promote. So, like, the, the situation with Twitter and, like, Elon Musk is making this brouhaha about how, like, they lied about their bots and you should pull out. Like, that was probably because he didn't want to pay for it. But the issue of things like they do report metrics. Every big tech company, every advertising support big tech company, or even ones that are subscription subscription based, report how many users they have every month. And that means for the ones that are advertising based, they have an active disincent disincentive from removing fake accounts. And I think one of the largest threats to our information environment is actually ro robotic amplification, like networks of inauthentic actors. And so this question of how are you going to establish traditions and standards and, and legal frameworks around auditing the new metrics of our economy is something we have to be talking about sooner rather than later. And I, I think that a lot of work, and uh, we're doing some of this at Stanford, but, but also in the kind of ecosystem on thinking about what these tech audits look like, I think is, is really quite important. I'll say one of the differences as we think about transparency in the tech sector as compared to the financial sector is that for the most part when you're talking about uh, transparency in the financial sector, it's, it's, it's much easier to define what you're talking about, which is basically the flow of money in the system. Whereas when you're talking about it, transparency in social media or in tech generally, right, it, there are huge trade-offs, right? So there are trade-offs with respect to privacy, which I, you know, having worked on a, uh, an attempt at a transparency regime for Facebook for five, six years, we, we really confronted. And so th there's no way that we're going to say that, you know, Facebook should be completely open uh, uh, so that your private messages would be uh, revealed to outside researchers or the government. And then second, related to that, is the, the risk of surveillance, right? And so that, that um, you don't want transparency to then facilitate other kinds of bad behavior. And, and the third thing I would say is gamesmanship, right? So that the more that you're transparent about, say, the algorithms, or about content moderation, the more that the creative that bad actors get in terms of trying to figure out how to uh, game the system. And so we, 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 one of the, the tasks in writing the transparency legislation is to say sort of transparency toward one end. And so the, 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 um, the types of transparency that are mandated include sort of widely viewed content, advertising, and algorithms. Um, but even that, you know, those are pretty big buckets, and, to, and it's, the devil will be in the details as to how we sort of force on these platforms through <clears throat> transparency. Thanks. Um, uh, when, we, when we ask questions, uh, who is going to do this, and uh, to what end, 
Web3 uh, enthusiasts usually say community. Blockchain will solve that. And uh, honestly, as an economist, I, I'm worried about incentives of people working on blockchain. Um, uh, they are not necessarily indeed motivated by the willingness to establish the truth. But then Wikipedia exists. And uh, every economist can tell you that Wikipedia should not exist. Uh, but it does, and it works, and it's a wonderful, a wonderful phenomenon. And so maybe blockchain will miraculously save, uh, solve our problems as well. <coughs> to what extent you believe in this? To what extent you think this communities like in Mastodon, for example, will solve all these problems, and at least some islands, some instances in Mastodon will actually work well, sufficiently well to to address those issues. Uh, I take Sam on has that many. So yes, there will be a Wikipedia on Mastodon or on the blockchain. And then the question is, well, what about the Nazis and the child molesters, right? <laughs> or they're going to have their instance as well. And so that that's the that's the difficulty. Is that sure there will be there will be rosy uh, uh, pictures that that we can see, but then uh, how do you control the uh, bad actors? And especially since the sort of the name of the game with decentralization is to devolve power down to you said the community. Well, as many communities, some of whom are have best interests at heart of society, and some that are out there for spamming and scamming, as well as uh, the more you know harmful uh, communities. And so. Um, there's nothing about decentralization. Decentralization blockchain is a technology. There's nothing about decentralization that solves these problems, except that if you worry, if you're worried about centralized power, and there are reasons to be worried about that from a competition and trust perspective, that that it does potentially address that. But uh, a lot of these other concerns, and, and I want to amplify something that Francis said, which is totally right, which is. One of the reasons we need greater transparency of these uh, in the current platforms is that we sort of need to study Facebook before it's irrelevant. Uh, because because uh, once we move to a greater encrypted messaging or um, or blockchain technology, it's not clear that we're going to be able to study them the same way. Well, one of the things which I know from economics is when companies go bankrupt, you suddenly have access to all the accounts. <laughs> and a lot of things have been studied exactly because companies like Enron were completely bankrupt, so you got access to all the records. Yeah, Brian, you want to respond? Yeah, first of all, I do remember Facebook when it was nice. Um, <laughs> but I think it gets to the core of what happened with Facebook is that you know, the advertising paradigm replaced what was initially a very organic and community-driven social network. And I think the, the complexity is there, there needs to be an economic model that rewards accuracy and where information that's better than other forms of information, there has to be a business model that rewards accuracy, not just attention. And I think that it's, it's difficult in social media because of the form versus a news article where you can actually read and look at the sources, you know, named entities and facts and information. I think there is a way in social media to create maybe a tokenized model where accuracy can, can rise to the top, or information that has more sources than other sources of information, or uh, the references within the information can be used not necessarily as a decentralized way to moderate, but there are basic ingredients that signal that this information has more sources than other forms of information. And this isn't new, this is like back to basics. I mean, this is why newspapers became authoritative. And what feels complicated about social networks is a lot of the information that is emerging, uh, that emerges organically from any given event is good information. It's a frustration that's being communicated. And facts and information that is not being covered elsewhere is being omitted from these networks. But I think where it gets, um, what we've had to deal with is Francis's point, there are orchestrated attacks on groups, individuals, societies, ideas, science, that are very, very expensive to counter and very complicated. Like the average government or individual does not have the resources to counter a massive robotic amplification of misinformation against them. And I feel like there is a dimension to this problem which is about regulation and is about regulating platforms, not because we're against free speech, but because you want the quality of the information to be distributed to be somewhat known. And I think transparency is a huge part of that. And I think AI can help 
to a certain degree, identify information that's better than others. I mean, we've seen governments have to identify, especially with the rise of ISIS videos, for example. The content moderation became very efficient because of the traumatic effect of individuals having to watch those videos. They trained machines to do that, so humans weren't subjected to that level of violence. I think there are, there are technology solutions to some of this, but I think there really needs to be an evolution in the legal framework around it. So just to, uh, the question, can blockchain solve this? Um, can it can fix these problems? Um, as Francis said, you know, it depends on exactly how to find the problems. But I also want to say that blockchain introduces various problems um, and that we should be uh, mindful of as well. Uh, blockchain is impossible to understand. Um, it requires a level of mathematical knowledge that exceeds my grasp. And I've spent a lot of time trying to understand blockchain. Um, and so what that means, essentially, is that we outsource the management and the understanding to someone else. Okay. Whereas I can understand how to roll my own server, I can't understand how to do proof of stake or, or any of those processes for blockchain. So ultimately, I'm relying upon someone else to do this for me. So blockchain has created lots and lots of intermediaries. And it turns out, if we follow blockchain's history thus far, that it's littered with corpses of companies that were not reliable intermediaries. Um, and so uh, the FTX example, where we were told uh, you know, this was for the good of the world, he's making money, he's becoming a billionaire so he can give 99% of it away, uh, etc. He was giving away money hand over fist to newspapers, to uh, NGOs, uh, to uh, to lots and lots of uh, you know uh, things that were very excited about the prospect of getting uh, free money. Um, I think that should make us a little bit uh, uh, you know uh, uh, at least skeptical of some of the uh, the easy embrace of this uh, new magic wand of tech solutionism. So I want to be cautious about this. Uh, I think there are, there are possibilities, but I think we, you know, we should. Uh, the, you know, Brian has been, uh, again, he's actually been talking about law more than anyone else, even, even Nate on this panel. And I think well, he's, there's a legal statement. Yeah, yeah. So I think that we need to make sure that lawyers uh, and uh, law is very much uh, present in all, these, uh, in all these systems. Can I, can I follow up on this? So I think uh, Brian says we need to create a business model where truth is rewarded, rises up to the top. And at some point you mentioned regulation. So you need to change the rules of the game so indeed uh, bad stuff goes down and good stuff uh, uh, goes up. Uh, so uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Today in Facebook, I think it started after 2016, the interference uh, in social media. I fully agree with you that we learn how cheap it is to attack and how expensive it is to defend. But basically what uh, Facebook did, they did something like what you just recommended. They used AI to identify bad stuff. Then they actually recruit humans, real humans, real fact checkers, certified fact checkers to check what is suggested as a suspect content. And uh, in principle, that's exactly what you recommended. And we still are unhappy with Facebook. And uh, uh, Zuckerberg wants to do metaverse. Metaverse doesn't seem to work. So. Uh, we've not solved this problem so far. So what is wrong with this model? What do you think? Oh, Francis knows. Yeah, Francis, go ahead. But, but, but I think that, like, well, like when we talk about third-party fact-checking failed, uh, like I recently had to go and like try to look up statistics on like how many articles get fact-checked a month. So, so one of the things that drives me crazy about Facebook on a regular basis is they, they, they do a lot of performative actions without giving us evidence of the substance of those actions. Of things like all their random uh, interventions for eating disorders and self-harm and those things, which get shown to very, very, very few people. Um, when it comes to third-party fact-checking, at the height of the program in 2021, they were doing like 300 articles a, a week, right? Like um, with their top fact-checkers. Not a week, a month. 300 articles a month. Um, and so it's one of these things where it's not a huge amount of volume. It's really, really meant to shave off just the very, very top of the head in terms of, vi of um, viral misinformation. 
And so I think one thing that is interesting in terms of um, options around like, what can we, how can we make a business model of credibility? Um, there are interesting alternative social media platforms. Um, there's one uh, right now that is in, uh, I believe they've started their alpha, so I think I can talk about it, but I, I haven't been authorized to, so I won't name the name. Um, where they're, they're, they're looking at the idea of, you know, should people acquire trust over time, kind of like with, like with Reddit, like the more validation you get on Reddit, the more trusted you are. Um, and, and should people be penalized for things like people calling in fact checks on them or having tiers of community reviewers. So, you know, um, on things like Wikipedia, part of why they can be effective is that they have tiers of moderators who do different rounds of editing and you can appeal up decisions to higher and higher tiers who have greater amounts of authority. And so I think there are opportunities where we can begin to have our algorithms have a concept of feedback loops, right? Like right now, our, uh, our, our social media systems are not feedback loops in terms of information content, they're feedback loops in terms of engagement. And so adding in more dimensions on which people are evaluated, um, I think there are ways that you can scale those systems so that they are not like jobs, but in terms of like at people, lots of different people are doing small amounts of contribution in terms of increasing signal on information quality. Can I still jump in on this? Because I think Francis is right that, uh, and, and I think it's important to notice a little bit of the, uh, the way she answered that question, which is to look at reputations of people as opposed to individual items. And that has to be the way that you, you think about this problem. So we have a, a, a series of studies that we did in conjunction with NYU, Josh Tucker's lab there, on crowdsourced fact checking, where we gave people every morning uh, articles from um, a left-leaning publication, right-leaning publication, one that wasn't ideological, and one that was like from a really bad source, according to NewsGuard ratings. And we gave it to 90 individual people and six professional fact checkers every day for about four months. All right, so we have a huge library of um, uh, information on this. And while well, the fact checkers often disagreed with each other. Um, even to the extent that they were in consensus, people were really bad at doing fact checking in the, in the day after a story broke. And that's what you have to think. I mean, these studies that look at um, people who, you know, who believe in the moon, the, the, the earth is flat, the moon landing never happened, those aren't terribly interesting from a kind of practical perspective. But to what extent in the wild can you get at viral disinformation before it causes harm? And the problem is you just don't, and this is sort of the Hunter Biden laptop story a little bit, as well as others, is that it's very hard in those 24 hours when it really makes a difference uh, for the platforms to then uh, make a difference. However, if you have a system built on the reputation of the users who are forwarding this, we do know that you know disinformation is a kind of 80-20 or 90-10 kind of problem, or even more than you, that where you've got super spreaders of disinformation, and the question is, do the platforms want to go after those those individuals. The problem from a political standpoint is that they are not, shall we say, politically random in the population as to who is most likely to engage in the promotion uh, and distribution of disinformation. So if, for example, it happens to be that one political party has adherents who are more likely to spread disinformation, a moderation system that then goes after them uh, is then going to uh, run into political roadblocks. Thank you. Francis, you wanted to add something? No, I was just I was just applauding going after super spreaders. One thing to remember is that basically all phenomena on social networks follow power laws. So it's like you were saying 80 to 80 20. There, it's more like uh, 99 one, yeah. right? <laughs> that if you do very very small interventions, like you take the 99th percentile of people who reshare misinformation and you just slightly demote content that comes from them because they're resharing not like twice as much as the median, but they're resharing a hundred times as much as the median you end up having huge declines in misinformation across the system. Like we're talking 30% declines by just down-regulating like a tiny, tiny fraction population. So, uh, so actually what you're saying is we can create a regulation where we demand uh, social media companies to go after the worst uh, perpetrators. But of course, uh, the social media companies need to invest more in fact checking because what you said, uh, I think is, really, really scary to what extent Facebook underinvests in fact-checking. They spend millions of dollars, not tens of millions even, millions of dollars a year for this. And of course, that means that they check so few articles that their AI algorithms can train themselves. So this is largely ineffective. This is, as you said, per 
per, uh, performing arts business. Huh? It's not it's not really fact checking business. So can we just impose saying you need to spend at least one percent of your revenue on this, or we can say you need to uh, slow down dissemination from the worst uh, users? Uh, do you think that is something that should be done? I think it's there. There's just like a, a, I think you're you're having rules that are based on scale. So like when you say something like one percent of your budget is uh, devoted to fact checking, that's similar to things like states pass laws saying things like all public buildings must have a certain amount of their budget invested in art. Mm -hmm. Right? Like there are things where we believe there are social goods, and we can do proportionate burdens um, based on scale. Um, I think the secondary thing though is um, I we know that there are patterns to misinformation. So most of the conversation we've had so far today has focused on uh, uh, highly developed states, um, you know, mostly democracies. Um, when we look at developing countries that are facing ethnic violence, we see many patterns involving templated misinformation. So things like, um, imagine you see some story come across your feed and it says, Minority group A is putting substance in bicycle seats to make people infertile, right? Like that templating, like, you know, minority group, some kind of neutral object, uh, grocery, grocery bags, plastic on food, variety of things, uh, the water, majority group. That templated misinformation is seen over and over again in places that have ethnic tensions. And one of the things that we saw at Facebook was that because they were so they had such a heavy emphasis on defensibility, they struggled to even look at patterns of how information is constructed um, and generalize enforcement policies so that third party fact checkers would have to re-research every single one of those allegations, even though very clearly they are part of a consistent trend. Can I just say that, at least in the United States, were there a uh, law that requires anything related to fact checking, it would be unconstitutional, um, that that, that if we're talking about disinformation, that is a, a, a no-go. We will see there's some very interesting cases that are going to the U.S. Supreme Court this year about liability of the companies as well as how the, the state's power to regulate them. But at least on the disinformation side, it's probably erring in the opposite direction. Okay, can I can ask you a question on this. So uh, you have a right to say whatever you want, whether it's false or true, but as a private company, do I have to provide you a platform? Do I have to make your content the most... Uh, distributed and disseminated uh, content on my private platform? Why is that? Um... Well, it, 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 when you say, do you, do you have to? The question is, can a law that forces you to restrict content, mm -hmm. um, does, can that be done consistent with the First Amendment in the US? And the answer is no. Okay. You, you just can't, you can, because anything that is dependent on some metric of truth mm -hmm that the government is then going to impose on, on the platforms is going to be uh, a no-go. There, there, there are other areas when you deal with harm, physical harm, where there might be greater latitude, but, but not when it comes to the truth of the information. Right. Nate, Nate I have a question on that one. Yeah. So in terms of, like, one of, the, one of the things that I foresee happening with Gonzalez, so for context for people who don't follow Supreme Court cases, like Hawk, uh, there is a case going to the Supreme Court basically asking, you know, when Section 230 is written, we basically had bulletin board forms. Like there, there were almost no recommender systems anywhere in the world. Um, you know, should now that we live in a world where people are designing these promotion systems, where they actually have like a lot of control over what gets distributed, does it make sense to continue giving them just carte blanche immunity? Like I'm assuming that one of the things that will happen if they do rule in favor of Gonzalez over YouTube is that it will cause so much chaos. It will be so disastrous in terms of like opening the liability gates that we will pass a law saying. Companies that follow the following steps, which we consider responsible, are like maybe they, they get some kind of pass on immunity, um, or like there's only some kind of rewarding in 230 to give some kind of safe harbor for certain kinds of actions. Nate, in a world where we had something like that, you know, if the government isn't saying this is what is true, we're just saying like, hey, you have to establish a way, like some kind of system and make it transparent. Like, is that the thing that would still be unconstitutional? Like, if you said you had to have content moderation systems of X, Y, Z type? It, it, that potentially could be constitutional, and, but but I want to make sure people in, in the room understand that, that this case, and as, as Francis uh, explained it, it's about harm, right? Because this is, these were um, parents were, whose kids were killed in a terrorist uh, incident, and the question is whether either YouTube hosting or recommending certain videos was sort of contributing to that kind of harm, which is very different than a generalized, you know, 
lie detector on the internet kind of mandate. And so, yes, I think there, there are ways to get at the liability question um, if the, the platforms are essentially contributing to physical harm or offline harm. And, and I think the way Francis put it, which is that there could be a pathway to immunity that if you don't follow certain steps, that that would be, that would be possible, yeah. Thanks. So let me pick up on the Gonzalez case, because it involves Paris, of course. Um, you recall the, uh, the horrific attacks, I think it's 2015? 2015. 2015, right, in Paris. Uh, and many of you um, probably uh, were here and you know, experienced them. Uh, so my family was actually here, actually, at the time. Uh, and I was the one who called my, uh, my wife uh, and uh, told her about the terrorism that they were at a restaurant at this exact moment in Paris. Um, and I think here, the question, uh, the plaintiffs in the case say, YouTube was responsible for the terrorism here. Uh, that is a pretty striking claim. Um, but let, let's just try to understand then what that means. Essentially, it means that anytime there's harm and someone has said something on the interwebs, um, that harm is attributable to the company that allowed that to be said. Um, and so uh, that's a pretty uh, remarkable leap of logic. And what it means, essentially, is that the interwebs suddenly become the most censored place in the world. Um, because now, the companies say, hey, look, if we allow someone to say something, how do we know that that isn't going to lead to harm down the line? And voila, we will be held liable because our algorithms unintentionally, intentionally, whatever you say, uh, promoted that content uh, to the person who was then motivated to do X thing. By the way, the, the, the actual connection on the facts and ground is just entirely speculation at this point. It's just very broad claims that uh, you know, ISIS terrorism, et cetera, uh, was promoted on these services, which if you follow these things, the services are, are you know, have long been, you know, lots of people complain, in fact, they're, they're in fact, suppress a lot of speech that should be more critical of the West, et cetera. Uh, and so, so this means, if you're, if you're following the logic here, that if you criticize the West in some way, and therefore radicalize someone, um, then you are possibly liable for allowing that criticism, then the company becomes liable for allowing that criticism on its site. That's a world where speech suddenly becomes very unfree. And so the, the Gonzalez case really holds huge implications for the ability to criticize the government, the ability to criticize authorities, the ability to criticize the West at large. Uh, so I think that's something, you know, you guys know much more about this, the facts on the ground than we do because I, you know, I sat uh, safe largely, I said that my family was here, but, um, but uh, this is something that you, it's worth thinking about and how we want the, the rules that structure this, the liability rules, have direct impact on what is going to be allowed to be said online. Thank you, Brian, and then... I, I, yeah. Can I kind of do one fact, quick fact check, though, on the, the, that question of, like, what was ISIS doing? So so to be real clear, like, I, I, I don't think the Supreme Court should have taken this case. I think it's going to be a disaster, no matter which way they rule. I, I agree with many things you said there in terms of, like, it will introduce a slippery slope. But back when ISIS was growing, there was lots and lots of news coverage on ISIS was really interesting in terms of a terrorist group because they had cracked the social, like, the social network formula. Like they had whole pipelines, they managed to like market a marketing funnel. Like they were actively using these social platforms to to find people, expose them, uh, find ways to escalate them up a commitment chain to get them to do violent acts. And so I think part of the question here is like around when is when does culpability step in? Because like people warned platforms like YouTube that this was going on. And so I think to to to. I don't think the Supreme Court should have taken it, but they, I, we shouldn't say they saw some videos, maybe something happened. It's like a question of like, how, when, when do you have responsibility to step in when something like this is happening on your platform? Thank you, Brian, and then we'll open to audience. Sure. Yeah, I think I would agree with Nate. It's going to be very difficult to, you know, to legislate free speech in social networks. But I think what we can 
you know, a, an incremental step would be transparency about the information you're consuming. And this isn't new. I mean, food safety is a pretty good analogy. Mm -hmm. Or traffic safety. There just are laws governing. Uh, it doesn't mean you're against farming to demand that you list the ingredients in a product. Mm -hmm. And I think there are ways for these for tech companies to they know a lot of information about the people that are posting information. Much more. If you're advertising with them, you actually have more information than the people consuming the information. That's why the micro-targeting is so asymmetrical in terms of the relationship between the source of the information and the consumer. So I think it's, it's not a, a free speech question as much as what can we do to create more transparency so that when you're consuming information, you know that that information comes from an account that was set up six hours ago, right? That the person has never posted before, that you know no information about them, and therefore you may not trust it. And so I think there may be ways to start to create, um, and we talked about it, tiers of how do you categorize the level of trust of the source of information? Not necessarily regulate its free speech unless it violates the policy of the platform. So I think there, there are steps that can be taken which don't necessarily contradict free speech. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being so patient. We still have about 20 minutes for questions. If uh, you have questions, please raise your hand. Okay. Okay, there is a question there. Uh, I'm just going to take the Q&A because we also have to oh, they have. Okay. Okay. Maybe you can start by then. And yeah, then yeah. Well, the yeah. Let's let's give the mic to the gentleman there, and uh, I'll read the questions. Hi, uh, it's working. Yeah. Thank you so much for the conversation. It was very enriching. Uh, there's there's a lot to say about all of this, and obviously you have thought about all of it much more than any of us here. But as we look at this space, uh, someone, one of you, many of you, said this transition won't solve everything. Uh, it's it's a new. It raises more questions, and it. Office of solutions. The same can presumably be said for transparency. Transparency helps better understand what's going on, but does not really solve any problem. Uh, to be clear, to be that. But I think in this specific space of information quality and disinformation, we spend a lot of time talking about manifestations of failure. Uh, there was uh, a piece of bad information. There was a bad video. There was a bad tweet. There was a bad campaign. But we don't really have metrics or benchmarks for success. We talk about transparency. We talk about uh, <coughs> tiers of users who are We don't. We don't really call out the element in the room, which is, no system is perfect. So what level of imperfection we need to accept? And what constitutes a definition of success that we can then allow for? And it says that someone who sometimes works with product engineering teams and who ask, what should I do? What's the answer here? And we don't really have that right now to give them. So I'm just curious for your thoughts. Is there a metric? Is there a heuristic which you think is the one that means success in this space? Who wants to take this question? Um, well, so let me say, you know, it depends which problem we're talking about as to what a successful uh, you know, response is. Let me say, first of all, I kind of think of transparency, if you'll excuse the expression, as kind of a meta law, right? It's, 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 it's a, it, 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 <laughs> transparency is a prerequisite for everything else that we would want to do, both because it'll educate policymakers, but also. If the platforms know that what they're doing is essentially going to be observed and known by outsiders, it will affect their behavior as well. Sometimes for better or for worse, we should be clear, right? There are certain things that happen behind closed doors um, where we should be concerned a little bit. You're talking about, like, say, in, in the terrorism uh, enforcement, that, yeah, transparency might have, um, uh, there, there might be un unintended uh, consequences. But what, so what would the metrics be? And the answer, I think, is almost that. When you have transparency, we can develop a lot of metrics that we don't currently uh, have. And to think about, you know, almost a market for metrics, but that the way we would uh, think about applying something, say, to YouTube, I mean, I, I think to some extent this is an impossible uh, question to answer because, um, you know, if it involves someone's life, right, no one's going to we're gonna say that, that no matter what happens, it's like if five people die because of YouTube videos, we're not going to say that that's, oh, that's tolerable. And so it's different than, I think, food safety or um, uh, drug safety in that way. But part of this is to get a sense of the trade-offs as to, you know, what, what can you do in, to both protect free expression on the one hand uh, while ensuring, ensuring safety on the other. And, and let me also say that it's not clear to me, you know, that, that, that transparency, I, there are three areas where, where people on the outside and the firms have diametrically uh, expressed positions. One is 
the, the scale of the problems, so whether it's disinformation, hate speech, and the like, those on the outside tend to think that these are huge problems on the platforms for the most part. Uh, if you talk to the folks at the platforms, it is a concentrated problem among a small share of users. Okay? The second is the role that algorithms are playing in recommending bad content, whatever bad content we're talking about. Those on the outside, with the exception of some social scientists that I think have been able to, to crack the code a little bit, those on the outside definitely say the algorithms are, are leading to these problems. Those on the inside say, no, the algorithm, you misunderstand how, how big a problem uh, the algorithms are. And the third is about political bias inside the firms. To what extent are the content moderation systems and algorithms leading to certain speakers being favored over others in a kind of politically biased way? All of those questions are answerable through transparency. If, 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 if you put me in the room you know, and got me the data on those things, we, we could actually try to bridge that gap. But right now, uh, we just don't have the answers. So I'll say one thing, which is that the platforms kind of introduce FUD around these issues by, by using terminology like, we reduced hate speech by 40% or something like that on our platform. Um, that's an impossible calculation. Uh, they're pretending they have a denominator. Um, and so because uh, what exactly is in those categories is very much a subject to the teams that are making those calls. Those calls can be made differently. We see uh, the Facebook oversight board that uh, makes different calls than the Facebook internal teams. And if there were oversight boards for the other uh, institutions, you know, we see variations in the interpretation of community guidelines. Uh, this is what, you know, law professors will certainly tell you about how law works. Uh, it, there are various ways to look at what, uh, how to interpret uh, what the truth is. And so one of the questions here, and one of the reasons that US law, at least, is very averse to saying there is a truth out there is because truth is very hard to determine. Uh, there, there's a kind of imagined ground truth that is well known or easily discoverable. But as uh, the, fact, the crowdsource fact checking example that uh, Nate talked about, uh, where people try and figure out what the truth is, and then they, you know, the fact checkers disagree on what the truth is, and the community uh, folks, uh, after investigation, don't decide what the truth is. Um, when judges are asked these questions, they take months and even years in the United States to come up to, for a decision in one case. Um, and so these are hard questions. We don't have good answers. Um, and I'm not sure there is a metric. Uh, so this, it may be that we moved into a world where uh, there, there, is, there are no obvious perfect solutions. And that is a complicated world to live in. So now you know why lawyers have paid so much. It takes so much effort to establish the, what the truth is, right? So. Um, I would argue the platform. I think, I think, yeah, Francis, go ahead. I think there's also, I think there's one of the other kind of implicit things in your question is there's there's just so much normative bias in terms of like when you say like let's define good because like we can come in there and say things like like Facebook did experiments where they said you know can we uh, like someone who is able to speak to both sides of the aisle um, is someone who has thought more about how to communicate like that's a harder process than just doing something that's like knee jerks to one side or the other. And they, they were able to develop metrics for identifying those kinds of con constructive conversational motifs. And they were able to model, like, is this person able to speak to a broader set of people? And when you uh, give a slight boost to content that comes from people like that, you do see reductions in things like misinformation and paid speech. Um, I think there are interesting questions around things like, you know, we talk about this idea of in the first 24 hours, it's very difficult to figure out what is happening and what is real. And I think there's interesting things around modeling over time people who are good at initial hunches, right? Like in a world where you said, hey, we, we, we have to figure out systems of governance that are more scalable. You know, if you are collecting data from like a large number of people on like, does this seem plausible? Um, you can end up in a world where you can have a, a first draft of history where at least the craziest stuff gets tampered. But the problem is sometimes the world does change in unpredictable ways. Like in a world like that, would we have seen the rise of, of, of the Black Lives Matter movement as much as we did? Like people, uh, people outside of the black community 
the idea that the police were being as violent was a foreign idea to them. And so in a world where we, you know, we were more biased towards people who are in general better at first reads on things, um, you know, it, it, we, we do face consequences from those trade-offs. So there are no perfect solutions, um, just ways of, of approximating better. Could I just say something so, so to agree with Francis on, on one point there, which is that while the average person uh, doesn't, the crowd doesn't do a great job of uh, sussing out what's true and false, you can, through machine learning, get some valuable signal from the crowd. That, I think, is, in, you know, in some ways, the, the hope with Birdwatch or whatever it's called, Community Notes now, and some other these things. And so, yeah, you can use the crowd in, 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 in those kinds of ways. Yeah. I also think we're seeing, I mean, corporate governance is an important part of this equation, too, because I would argue, I would argue the platforms have been very successful from a product engineering standpoint, so successful that we're here tonight talking about them. But I think that um, what happened on Twitter was very interesting, that they lost a massive amount of advertising revenue because the brands not, did not necessarily want to be associated um, with the rhetoric that would <clears throat> potentially emerge in a Twitter that was not enforcing the same level of content uh, governance, right? And so I think there's there's going to be like, it's going to be a multi-dimensional solution. It's going to require new economic incentives, which you see in newspapers, like the best news stories, you see them shared the most. Potentially they're the most salacious in some cases, but you know, if you look at which stories in the New York Times or Le Monde or Washington Post, they tend to be by journalists who've done really good investigative reporting, they have great sources, I mean, not in all cases, but it's maybe not, you know, everybody's a super nerd. But I think there, there are new, there are opportunities to create economic models that reward, that the recommendations are based on the quality of the information and the fundamental um, using machine learning, for example, to come up with some indication of the quality of the information that's being shared. But I also think that corporate governance is going to be a big part of it. Like, it's advertising is such a huge part of the information economy that Mastodon, you know, could thrive, you know, in terms of pocketed communities of people, but it's not going to it's not going to have the same societal impact that Twitter has for right or for wrong. And I even remember Glassnet in Russia, Moscow, right, the very beginning when the wall came down, for example, there was a massive amount of like of collaboration um, on how to address what's next in the new Russia and CIS. And that was all about trust and people communicating. And you could tell who you were talking to based on what was the content of that network where they came from. So I think social media is still a tremendously important part of the future of society. But we need to come up with ways um, that are, I think Francis mentioned, that scalable systems of governance. And the technologies exist to help do that, but I think we do need frameworks to enforce the level of transparency and accountability required to get to the next level. Thank you. We have seven minutes uh, remaining, and we have four questions in on Zoom. Um, uh, Francis can see them. Uh, Brian, Anupam, and uh, Nate can see them when they turn back. Uh, so uh, I suggest that. Uh, uh, we do a round of speakers uh, around the tables, and you pick your favorite question or two and answer. So the first question is about uh, can we balance uh, regulation of uh, Web 3.0 with the need to keep economic dynamism, innovation, and so on. The second question is something related to this monopoly of Apple, but it's in this case it's monopoly of data storage, which is Amazon. right? To what extent we should think about the Web 3.0 being decentralized, if it's all stored on the one big company's uh, cloud services. The third one is something that we kind of talked about. Can we mar marketize reputation and therefore uh, create tokens of trust? And uh, then the last question is by Leila, uh, who is uh, asking the, about the business model of uh, Mastodon Web 3.0. Is Mastodon Web uh, 3.0 or is Web, Web, Web uh, 3? So I suggest we go in the opposite direction this time around. So we start, uh, start with Francis. Uh, please pick your favorite questions or just say something you want uh, people to take away from this panel. Sure. Um... I think let's, why don't we kind of 
touch on question one and two. So uh, I think one of the things that's going to be super interesting about the rise of decentralized platforms is depending on how you architect those decentralized platforms, there may be very little ability of governments to step in and enforce regulations on them. So there, I remember originally when I came out, like I, I kind of rolled my eyes and people talked about Web3 social networks because I, I used social networks from a framework uh, like a, a previous bias as someone who had worked on the algorithms of multiple social networks that in my mind, part of what made social networks attractive was that recommendation vote power, right? That every time you open your phone, you know, Facebook, Pinterest, wherever, looks at thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of pieces of content that you might like and picks out a handful to show you first. Um, in a world where you, um, if you if you keep that as a prior, you say like, oh, that is a fundamental characteristic of a successful social network. I think we are going to see a continued reliance on some centralization. So, you know, we talk about in the question too of like, you know, if stuff still on AWS, is not still centralized? Um, if you want to be able to do that, you know, have tens of thousands of, of items that are potentially loosely connected to you and have recommendations, I think it's going to be very hard to do that without having some centralized servers. And a lot of the pitches I've, I've heard currently for doing decentralized social networks have a recurrent problem, which is the individual service providers have to copy the data off the blockchains in order to provide services like that. But if you give up that assumption, if you come in and say, no, 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 we're going to do a true decentralized social network, we're going to do something maybe a little closer to Signal, or maybe even more decentralized than Signal, where you know I have my friends scattered around the world, there may be content that lives on a, a central server for a brief window, or, or maybe even a decentralized server for a brief window of time until my friends actually get it on their devices. Um, but the most things are going to be more peer-to-peer -peer directly. Um, you know, you could make a social network in that world where it's extremely decentralized, and that would also be an extremely hard to govern social networks. Um, it would also be a very hard one to stop because, like, as long as it's running peer to peer, you know, maybe you can block it from app stores. But that's about it. Um, but that world is also safer in that it's hard. Like, most of the problems, in my view, around misinformation are coming from a very small number of users who are very aggressively spreading misinformation and or nation states who are doing these large scale automated networks. Um, in a world where you have more, you know, you have it be more about your family and friends, you know, it's smaller scale, you can have a lot of social contact, a lot of community without having the same problems that affect virality. So, you know, it might go hand in hand that if you really want to be outside the, the grasps of um, the ability to touch in and regulate because you're using AWS, using other centralized large scale services, it might be that you might get forced down into a scale where you are more likely to be safe just by by the limitations of what you're left with. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Nate? Um, um, since Ron mentioned my name, I'll uh, just deal with this question about, uh, well, whether Web3, um, do, do I consider Mastodon uh, Web3, and, and then also what's the business model, and then I'll say one thing about uh, disinformation, which is, um, to some extent, Web3, Web three is whatever you make out of it, right? It's, it, it's defined because it's not Web two, is I guess the, the way to put it. Um, and so I, I think that that's why I focus on decentralization as opposed to you know whether it's two or three or two point five or two point seven. And so I think that um, uh, to what extent are these technologies, blockchain is certainly the kind of standard against which Web three is being judged, but it's not the only only thing that we should be looking at. And so. Um, Mastodon, it was very interesting at this uh, conference that, that Francis and I were at in Miami uh, last week, um, there was a debate about this, and it's like, well, whether Mastodon was Web3 or not, and it's like, you know, Mastodon's Mastodon, it has, the, it has, it has these de decentralized characteristics, and it offers that kind of uh, way of looking at the problem. And I'll say, picking up a little bit on what, what Francis was saying, uh, I also think it's really important, whenever you talk about these content problems, to ask what I call the WhatsApp hypothetical, right? Because uh, mm. those of us in 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 the U.S., we, we, WhatsApp is not used a whole lot in the U.S. You, in Europe, it's it's used quite a bit, and certainly in the developing world, it's used a lot. And all of these problems that we see of, with respect to content moderation, hate speech, uh, disinformation, and the like, especially when they're organized actors, state actors like like Francis was talking about, who are seeking to manipulate the social network, we see it, you know, a hell of a lot. Whether it's Brazil, India, you pick, 2018. You, pick, you pick the the country. And remember, WhatsApp doesn't have an algorithm; it doesn't have advertising. 
right? And so if, if you're gonna, gonna focus on these kinds of problems uh, with respect to content and virality, you gotta deal with uh, the WhatsApp hypothetical. So do you, want, do you want to answer the very last question which came up uh, during during your intervention? If you want to pick up one thing uh, to fix uh, social media within two years, uh, what would you pick? Uh, if, if you don't have a solution, it's okay. I think I think we already got your answer. Transparency. Yeah, 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 WhatsApp it is, does not have an algorithm that promotes things. Instead, it's individuals sending to their individual networks, right? So, and it's yet a huge problem across the world. So we have to figure out what is, you know, if we, so what that tells me is really there's not one single solution to this problem. There's not a simple way to say the algorithm's at fault. Or it's adver so what, what we also hear is it's advertising. If, if we only got rid of advertising, we would solve everything. Um, and if we just made people pay, then the world would be much better. And all of that is a kind of magic wand solutionism uh, to the realities of how complicated this terrain is. When you give people the power to speak with each other, unfiltered to a large extent, that creates it, that opens up a Pandora's box for good and bad. Uh, all the good things uh, Francis said about uh, BLM and Me Too uh, only occurred because of the internet and the virality that it offered. The ability to say this person in authority is actually uh, has done something terrible. Um, and that is something that the platforms offered that it wasn't easy to put in the newspapers because the newspapers were worried about what liability. Uh, and so uh, they, this the exact kind of thing that wouldn't appear in the newspapers. This uh, sexual harassment or uh, abuse of you know black people in the United States and across the world uh, wasn't invented in, in the in this century uh, or this millennium. This has existed for a long time, uh, and so uh, but we're hearing about it now because of these things. That's the good part. All the other bad stuff is also at the same time here, and there. And I think we should be careful about that one. Uh, I'm going to defer to Francis. Yeah, Francis. Yeah. Okay. I want to, again, didn't we talk about WhatsApp two figures in a row? I want to see like a tiny little tweak on that. Um, so, so in the case of WhatsApp, I think it highlights the role of friction, right? So, like one of the most important things that was done to radically reduce misinformation on on WhatsApp was they said, "Hey, we're going to have a little piece of metadata to travel with the message." So, this is not a centrally controlled way of dealing with misinformation. This is a, a way that is actually included in the message. And if that gets reshared more than five times, people can still repeat it, but they have to copy and paste. When that same experiment was run on Facebook.com, but they said, hey, let's let's cut it at friends of friends. So misinformation, once it moves to more than two hops down a reshare chain, let's say you can say whatever you want. You can speak your power, but you have to choose to. You can't just you know reflexively hit reshare. That is the same impact on misinformation as the entire third-party fact-checking program. I remember the third party fact checking is by blunting the most viral, most highly distributed misinformation. Um, but it scales. And so in the case of WhatsApp, if WhatsApp implemented a standard where they said, hey, once it gets beyond friends of friends, you have to like intentionally share this. Um, it would a lot of the conversations we have about the dangers of WhatsApp would, would would radically go down. But it's one of these questions of like WhatsApp doesn't want to admit that their products are dangerous. And so I think the, the real question becomes like, we know ways of making these products safer, but when we move into a de decentralized space, we may lose the ability to have ways of pressuring the systems to adopt techniques like that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Since we talk about um, Facebook and WhatsApp, let me remind you that uh, in, in the recent history, we had a Facebook president and a WhatsApp president. And the Facebook president was an anti-corruption activist, uh, Klaus Johannes, president of Romania, who won his campaign in a, well, the most corrupt country in Europe. Romania is an officially, officially the most corrupt country in the European Union. He won it on Facebook. So this is your uh, liberation technology. But we also have a WhatsApp president, and that is uh, Jair Bol Bolsonaro, who won his campaign in 2018 on WhatsApp exactly because of the features you mentioned. And one other feature, which we shouldn't forget, this is something that people in developing countries know. Sometimes Facebook gives you 
uh, zero ranking plans, yes. where you get Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, but you cannot go to fact-checking websites because that's the only internet you have, and with that, you can disseminate this information intentionally, which Bolsonaro's campaign did, and the users could not fact check because they most Brazilians at that point would use zero ranking plans. This is zero rating plans. So this is a reality which is very different from the one uh, we enjoy in Europe or the United States. So it's both good and bad. It's both liberation disinformation technology. Uh, in Science Pool, we start uh, things uh, five minutes late. We try to finish on time. We are five minutes late still. So I would like to wrap up here. I would like to write, uh, run a round of applause for our speakers because I learned a lot and I'm a bit more optimistic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm just not convinced how they come, uh, come up with optimism after that conversation. <laughs> but I'm glad that you... Well, you have a solution. Both of you agree on the solution. What's not to like? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. And thank you, Brian. Brian did warn us that he had to leave. It's not because he was scared and ran away because of what we said. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.